Days getting darker, what you gonna do? Where will you be? Where will God find you when you are done? Whoa, when you are done. Time's getting short. Ladies and gentlemen, we welcome you to another episode of the podcast for Without Spot or Blemish Ministry. So glad you're here today. Today we're going to talk in the wake of the Blasey Ford Kavanaugh scandal, which is Brett Kavanaugh being nominated by President Trump for the position of Supreme Court Justice. And he's in his, quote, interview stage or just completed it. And now an FBI investigation has been started. And I just want to talk about how this whole thing, in my view, is one giant gaslight of the American people. And why? To continue to divide and conquer us. To get us at each other's throats so that we'll ignore everything else they're doing. It's literally a wagging the dog type activity. They roll this out on us at least once a month. And this is the flavor of today. Who knows what's next, but for me, America as we once knew it is long over, and there's no getting it back. I'm going to discuss why that's the case. And really, America is said to have been a Christian nation from its inception, but honestly, it's been a Freemasonic nation from its inception. I've proved that in a lot of other podcasts, but it's clear when your founding president, George Washington, is a 33rd degree Mason that something's not right and I'll discuss why it is that they allowed us so much religious freedom uh, for the beginning of our our nation and what purpose was for that but I'm also going to talk about how this case of the Brett Kavanaugh nomination for Supreme Court Justice is being used to divide and conquer us but it's also being used as a test a test of this nation and what we're going to do about abortion. And we'll get more to that after we pray. Father God, I just praise you and thank you for your presence here. I thank you for blessing us to have your presence here, to take over this podcast, to lead us, to teach us as Christians what's really going on. Satan and his minions in the government and the media are constantly trying to confuse us, to gaslight us, to get us off topic, off focus, off what you're really trying to do. And the control that they have over what we see, hear, read is immense. And they, this week, directed millions and millions of us to watch this case unfurl. And Father God, I just felt the entire time that We are being gaslighted, and I just would like you, Father God, to just show us all the length, breadth, and depth of how we've been done so, and help us to focus on you, Father God, in these last days, that we wouldn't get so caught up in what the governments of the world are doing, that we'd be caught up in you and in your word and to getting this bride, the bride of Christ, ready for the bridegroom, getting ourselves to become without spot or wrinkle and holy and without blemish. Father God, that is the goal of this ministry, to help everyone, including myself, to get to that point where we can receive you, Father God, and not letting the media and the government draw us into things that are only meant to divert us from that goal. So I just praise you and thank you for for guiding us in that. And in the mighty name of Jesus, I bind up, rebuke, and command every demonic spirit to leave this studio, to leave me alone. Any spirits of narcissism, Jezebelism, pride, arrogancy, haughtiness, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life I command to leave, not only me, but every listener. I come against all demonic attacks on all of us, especially with regard to demonic attacks of untruth that are coming against either me or the listener. And I rebuke the lies. I rebuke the demons who brought the lies. I bind you up in the name of Jesus, and I command you to leave every listener and to leave myself. I bind up any convoluted message from being said by me or received by the listener in the mighty name of Jesus. And the saint said, Amen, Amen, and Amen. So as I said in my introduction, I want to briefly touch on what I believe to be the history of the United States. And there have been many people in the Christian world who have said that we were begun as a Christian nation. And I sort of oppose that. I think we were begun as a Freemasonic entity. 
and because so many of the founders were Freemasons, including George Washington, as I mentioned. And the reason I bring that up, the mere fact that I don't believe we're a Christian nation is proven out by the layout and the design of Washington, D.C. and all of its monuments, including an obelisk coming through a Vesca Pisces international monument. And just the just everything about Washington, D.C. screams uh, paganism and Freemasonry. So and then, of course, we have in our harbor in New York, we have a an Ishtar uh, idol there in the Statue of Liberty. I mean, all of these things are forbidden. You know, graven images are forbidden. And we have one in our in the harbor of our biggest, most financially important city. And of course, D.C., you just can't refute that the layout is entirely Masonic. So. The, our Defense Department is in something called a Pentagon, a five-pointed uh, object. Five-pointed stars represent Satan. So, I mean, there's just, there's just too much. It's too easy to prove all of this out. So, you may wonder why we began with a Bill of Rights that included freedom to, of practice of religion, to practice whatever religion you wanted, and why we had such a strong Bill of Rights that uh, protected us, you know, from search and seizure, uh, protected, allowed us to bear arms, allowed us a, a level of freedom that most nations had never seen uh, before or since. You know, America seemed like it was just set up on a document that provided for freedom. Well, I believe the reason that freedom was allowed was so that this nation could become prosperous and economically very wealthy because they knew that they were going to for lack of a better word, rape that wealth. They knew that they were going to use that wealth to continue in their long-term plans. You know, the Illuminati, if you want to call them that, the Freemasons, they have very extreme long-term plans that they're, that they're executing even now. And that's why so many of our freedoms are in jeopardy now and in question. And the entire Bill of Rights is being brought um, to a place where they no longer hold much weight in society you know, you have to register to have guns now. Uh, all, that's from the Second Amendment, where there was supposed to be freedom to bear arms. And now those freedoms have been whittled away to where it's become very difficult to have a gun without going through a long-term process. And I don't want to argue that point. That's not what this message is about. But all of the freedoms that were set up in the Bill of Rights were intended to make, in my view, make this nation extremely wealthy so that wealth could be utilized in the future. And it's happened that way. We started off with no income tax. They started an income tax in 1913. And now we are taxed coming and going for every single thing you can possibly think of. And so all that wealth is being siphoned off and returned uh, back to the people in power. And that's what this is all about. So I bristle a little bit when people say that we used to be a Christian nation. I, I don't believe that. I believe we were a Freemasonic, Satanic nation run by Satanists, but I do believe that there were many Christians growing up as wheat among the tares. So Christians did come here for freedom because our Constitution and Bill of Rights provided for that. That was set up again, in my view, to create enough economic wealth that they could siphon off of it and use it in the end times, which is what they're doing now. So that's my view on that. Now, about the kavanaugh Blasey ford thing. It's very rare for me personally that I get drawn into watching escapades such as these. I mean, it was a disgrace, a natural, a national disgrace for our country what just happened this week. And that came out of Brett Kavanaugh's mouth. Does that mean I support him fully? No, I just think I agree that it was just hugely embarrassing to see all of that uh, portrayed, you know, in the national media and what's supposed to be a hallowed hall of our nation in the Senate. But we know it's not hallowed. We know Satan is the prince of the darkness of this world. He's the prince of the rulers of this world. And our rulers, as you could well tell by observing all of the senators, they are some of the most evil people, the most despicable, lowest forms of life I've ever seen in my life. And you might ask, well, why do you say that? They all seem clean cut and well-spoken and, you know, they were well-represented and well-educated and, and they come from the Ivy League schools and the, the cream of the crop, the elite of our nation. 
That's not what I see when people are in there truly trying to make sure that Roe versus Wade is maintained as the law of the land with regard to abortion uh, rights being allowed, not only allowed, but, but fostered. So our nation is a nation of murdering of the most innocent blood there is. And it's nearly every nation of the world practices abortion, but we do it at levels that uh, don't necessarily uh, eclipse other nations, but we do it at levels that are bigger than any other form of murder on a nationwide scale, bigger than what Stalin did, bigger than what Lenin did, bigger than what Hitler did, because we have killed over 60 million babies since 1973 and Roe versus Wade uh, was passed. And what was Roe versus Wade? Well, it was a Supreme Court case which allowed for abortion. Before this case, it was actually illegal in the land. And so if you look, the last three uh, potential candidates for Supreme Court, whether it was Bork or whether it was Clarence Thomas, who is on there, uh, or if it, whether or not it's Kavanaugh now, they of all three who were supposedly sent there to be pro-life and against the murdering of innocent children, which is abortion. All three of them were supposedly on that side, and these liberal abortionists, the murderers of children that blood all over them. I think if we could see in the spirit, every one of those senators would have the blood of millions of children over each one of them because they are in power and they are the part of the, of the political machine which supports abortion. And so and maybe someone's listening that's a pro-abortion advocate and you believe that it's just a blob of tissue and that uh, w women have the right to choose what to do with their bodies. But the baby doesn't have the right to choose for life. The baby, the child inside of that womb doesn't have the right to choose. And so in the end, that's what th this all comes down to. And so the reason why Kavanaugh has been borked, he was the first one to truly have his life just torn apart by this nomination process. The reason why Kavanaugh is now going through much worse than probably Bork did is because of the fact that if he sticks to his guns he and remains pro-life, then he is possibly going to be a vote that could overturn Roe versus Wade and as an interjection for this, I just want to say that I believe that Republicans that represent themselves as pro-life aren't necessarily that. I think that, as I'll point out later on in this podcast, that all the world's a stage and many of the people in power on the so-called Republican side, they want to have their satanic sacrifices in abortion just as much as the Democrats. But their part to play is that they believe that abortion is sinful, as Christians do, and they want to portray that they want to stop it. But in, the, in their back rooms, in their parties, in their gatherings, in their get-togethers, their eyes wide shut get-togethers, that's not who they are. They're back there smoking cigars, drinking um, their uh, whiskeys, and just yucking it up with the Democratic senators. They're all thick as thieves together, is what I truly believe, and I believe it's the same way with regard to people in power in the courts, especially in the Supreme Court, that they will put up a lot of fuss and there will be a lot of you know, banter about abortion or, or opposing arguments and opposing sides, but that's just to play it out for us, to make us think that, at least make the conservative Christians believe that they're being represented when that's all they're doing it for is to present themselves that way. It's just smoke and mirrors. It's not real. Otherwise, when Bush was in power and he had a, a House and Senate that were Republican majority, he would have done something to change it. But he's skull and bones, and skull and bones loves uh, blood sacrifice, I'm sure. So where is there a Jezebel connection in this? Well, the Jezebel connection is one of wanting to see children, babies, innocent life continued to be sacrificed. Satan, Satanists love to sacrifice innocent life. They feel like it increases their power more that Lucifer, their God, receives them and, uh, and gives them more power for the, um, the type of sacrifice that is pure innocence. Even Aleister Crowley in his writings uh, alluded to that, that if you have a young male uh, that sacrificed a, 
you know, someone of, of good character and high intelligence, you know, obviously can't tell if a baby's highly intelligent, but the youth of the, of the, of the child that's being sacrificed, the innocency, the fact that it hasn't sinned, it hasn't even lived yet. It's done no sin. It's, it's perfectly pure. That's one thing that they love to do. And you cannot tell me that in many, many abortion clinics are not actual Satanists in there practicing rituals through these abortions. You can't tell me that's not the case. I mean, I, I believe with my whole heart that there are many Satanists working in abortion clinics and they are to increase their own power with de- with demons and devils, but they don't realize it's to their own detriment. And so you have that aspect of it, the satanic aspect of it. And one way that was reflected was the fact that Alyssa Milano, who played a witch in the mo- in the television series called Charmed, she was on the same show, and not uh, coincidentally with Rose McGowan, who was also on Charmed as one of the three witches. So these two have been huge in this uh, Me Too uh, movement, and these two are are satan- Satanists first and foremost. Uh, one I can quote Rose McGowan herself saying that she was a bigger Satanist than Marilyn Manson, whom she was married to at one point. They're divorced now. And it's clear to me that Alyssa Milano is the same. She is a satanic witch. And they're not just practicing witchcraft for fun and and games on television with their show, which is obviously, it's in syndication now. It's no longer being filmed with new shows or anything, but it's still on TV every single day during after school hours for children and little girls to watch too. So they'll be practicing more witchcraft. You know, there's a guy call for the up call for an uprising. He talks about this all the time, and I think he's right about that, with beyond a shadow of a doubt. And so the fact that she was there is absolutely no surprise to me. That was Jezebel in the midst. She's a very beautiful woman, and of course Jezebel was beautiful, and most people with that spirit are beautiful. And what it's there to do again, this whole Me Too movement. I'm not saying that people that have been molested. I have been molested myself. And I'm not saying that people shouldn't come out and and talk about it and bring it to the light. I'm not saying that at all. I'm not trying to degrade anyone that would do that. But what I'm saying is that the Me Too movement is being used to further solidify the power of Jezebel, the power of the female goddess, and to degrade the power of men in the so-called patriarchy. That's what this is all about. So to bring him forward and to completely emasculate him and accuse him if it's false, which it sounds like it is. And I'll talk about the gray area of both sides uh, before I'm done. But if this is a whole narrative, which I think it is, I think this is a play that they put on for us. It's a literally uh, a planned out scripted movie that they've done for us, for us all to watch and us all to take in. And as we take in both sides, those of us that are on the pro-life side are obviously wanting to support Kavanaugh, and Kavanaugh has his flaws. And then those of us who are pro-abortion or, or pro-feminist or pro-Me Too movement will be on Blasey Ford's side. And then we have this huge chasm between the two, and then it's going to have us even further at each other's throats. And that's what the Me Too movement is meant to do. So in my view, the way this sets up is that we have three different categories of Hegelian dialectic being run on us. We have uh, where they're, they're setting up a divide and conquer. It's pro-life versus pro-murder. I'm, call, I'm no longer calling pro-abortion. I'm calling it pro-murder. Um, then it's man versus woman. It's feminist versus uh, a man that wants to continue on living as a normal man and not be completely emasculated and uh, made to take on feminine characteristics and to act like a simp and a cuck and a follower of women. Um, So you've got that. Then you've got uh, Republican versus Democrat. So you've got these three categories where they're really trying to tear us apart. And one way you could tell they've been doing a good job of it is the whole MGTOW movement that's grown as a result of this feminist spirit, because there's men that just don't want to lose what they deem as their manhood. They don't want to, they don't want that to happen. And so the further divide has been created by that. And man, they're, they are executing this nearly to perfection. And the only way to escape these Hegelian dialectics, to escape these divide and conquers is to rise above it through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
But having said all that, let's just take how they're using Kavanaugh and Blasey Ford. So what I've seen in when they run these psyops, this is a psychological operation. And what I've seen when they run these psyops is there's always gray area on both sides. I'm going to go back to two things where they tried to divide us on race, especially black versus white. You've got the episode in Florida with Zimmerman and Trayvon Martin, and it is made out on one side that Trayvon Martin was uh, had done some kind of robbery. He was roaming the neighborhood. He was up to no good. He was being nefarious. And then you've got the Zimmerman guy that was stalking him and and uh, following him when it was probably unnecessary. And then you've got, you know, one side saying that Zimmerman just attacked him, but the, uh, but the other side saying that, that Trayvon Martin attacked him first and was trying to hurt him badly. And, you know, it's just complete gray area. And the reason why it's set up as gray area where both sides could be right and both sides could be wrong is so that what will be latched onto by each faction will be the right aspect and they'll ignore the wrong aspect of what their own character did and latch onto the right and then fight one another. It was the same with that situation in St. Louis and or that suburb of St. Louis, which was Ferguson, where Michael Brown attacked that police officer or was reaching in for his gun, supposedly into the car and ended up getting shot himself but you know bystanders said that he was reaching in the car but evidently he some people say he said hands up don't shoot and you know the the story is convoluted so one side here's one story the other side here's another story and you cannot really tell who's right or wrong and you can reach for what you think is right in each situation and then suddenly you're fighting one another because you're going to latch on to you to whatever your tribe is supporting And what I mean by that is that all of this is a form of tribalism, that they know, these handlers of society know that if they can get us fighting on a tribal level, then we will latch on to whatever our side is saying. And that's why tribalism is definitely being uh, executed through CNN or through uh, NBC, um, MSNBC, And through Fox News. So the people that are on the Republican side, the more conservative side, the neocon side, they'll watch Fox News. And then the people that are more liberal watch CNN and MSNBC and get their news that way. And so that it's incredibly tribal on both sides. This is done on purpose, such is the case, because they know they're creating more tribalism by having these left or right leaning news broadcasters. So they've done it to great success. But the main divide in our nation is showing in this one case is abortion. Should abortion be legal or should it be banned because it's murder? (laughs) The answer is so obvious to me. I don't understand how anyone could think otherwise and have any, any morality whatsoever. But getting back to these two characters, Blasey Ford and Kavanaugh. So let's start off with Blasey Ford since she was first. My first reaction when they peddled her out there was when she began to speak, I immediately thought this person sounds like she's trapped between the ages of eight and 12. She was so mealy mouthed and so tiny sounding and so arrested development, quiet and mousy with the way she spoke and, and honestly, very whiny. You know, obviously she acted like she was about to cry the whole time. And to me, I use the word acted because it came off as very contrived to me. Most of the talking heads I heard talking on the news about it, they were constantly saying how credible she was. To me, she was incredible. I, I, I didn't feel she was credible at all. And I say that because here we have a person that's a PhD. We have a person that went to undergrad at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She got into that school from out of state. That school is almost impossible to get into from another state. They have a very small percentage of their student bodies from another other states, and they make it really tough to get in there. And as far as public institutions go, it's been top five in the country for as long as I've been alive, as far as I know. Every, every ranking I saw, Chapel Hill was up there with Michigan and UVA and uh, the other very prominent public institutions, Chapel Hill is extremely difficult to get into from out of state. 
I lived in North Carolina for over, what would that be, 12 years of my life. And I never met anybody from Chapel Hill that wasn't confident. So, or, or came across as lacking in confidence or in, unable to speak for themselves in a way that was assertive. That doesn't mean that there isn't anyone that's graduated from there that isn't like that. But the other aspect of Blasey Ford is the fact that she went to graduate school at USC, University of Southern California, another very difficult school to get into. She teaches graduate level uh, psychology at University of Palo Alto. And I think she also had some done, has done teaching at Stanford too. So we're talking about some of the finest institutions in our country she sounded, unless she was using uh, psychological terms for, you know, for, for physical reactions to psychological things, she used the medical terms on several occasions. Aside from that, it literally sounded like she was like a 12-year-old at best. And it seemed to me very contrived. And I cannot see how someone that runs, runs a classroom, you know, I've been a teacher myself, I only taught in the public school system for three years and maybe teaching public school requires you to be more assertive and in control of your class. I've just never seen someone who is a teacher who is paid to stand up and professionally speak to people, be so lacking in assertiveness, lacking in ability to tell a story. And I feel like the fact that she wasn't that way makes it even more contrived because of the fact that she was acting like she was still traumatized by what happened all supposedly 36 years ago. And I'm not saying that, that if such were the case and it really happened that she wouldn't be, but I feel like it was overacted. I feel like at one, some point during this, she would have been able to assert herself and I just, I, I'm, I'm, these are my observations, whether they're truth or not, you know, that's, that remains to be seen, but this is what I felt in my spirit. Also, teachers are used to, and are accustomed to speaking in front of people. They really don't get as nervous as other people. The teachers I know myself having been a teacher and also preaching and stuff. I'm not saying that you don't ever get nervous and yes, that was a big stage and millions and millions of people were watching, but the nerves I don't think would have taken over as much with her. She would have been able to better represent herself in a more assertive way than what she did in my view, based on all the experience she's had as a public speaker. I mean, it's her life. It's her living. She stands up in front of graduate level students they're the cream of our intellectual crop and she's actually teaching them. And does she do that from that perspective? Like if I walked into a classroom and someone taught with her sort of demeanor, I don't think I would take that class. And I'm not trying to be critical of women either. It's not a woman thing. It's, it's, she acted like a child, like she never got past the age of 12. So that whole thing that threw me for a giant loop. Now, aside from that, all the various holes in her story just were, you know, not knowing exactly where the house was, not knowing who took her or brought her home, not remembering. That part is really troubling to me that this major event could happen and that you could run out and you could get taken home by somebody and not remember who it was. I just can't see how that would have happened. I mean, there's just so many holes in it. Did it happen? Maybe it did. Do I think Kavanaugh is telling the truth about everything? Absolutely not. And we're going to go to him. But the point I'm trying to make about Blasey Ford is that we have the juxtaposition of this person that's supposed to be a doctor of letters uh, and working and going to some of the most elite, in quote, I wouldn't send a kid of mine to any of these schools because they are just liberal brainwashing centers. But at any rate, nevertheless, I don't buy that that personality that she presented was real. And it, she looked in her eyes. I don't know if it was because she had almost Coke bottle level glasses on, but her eyes looked crazy to me. And going back to my podcast just prior to this, I've never met a psychiatrist or a psychologist that wasn't a little nutty, more than a little nutty. That's just my own anecdotal observations. Maybe you can introduce me one to one. But if she's not a Christian and doesn't know the truth about the gospel, 
there's something wrong, obviously, from a biblical standpoint. But she looked crazy to me. She looked literally nutty. Again, that's all part of it. That's part of creating the gray area where the people that are in opposition to Blasey Ford see all these things and it resonates with them that, hey, something's off here. Surely Kavanaugh is right. And so you are in a tribal way gravitating toward Kavanaugh because you've got all of these holes in her story and her demeanor. And, you know, it's just it's just clear that there's so much gray area that you don't know how to handle that side. So you go to the side that feels right to you. And then you get gray area on the Kavanaugh side too. But if you're in his tribe, you're willing to overlook that gray area. And that's what the social controllers want. They want us in the tribes fighting for our side and they create these gray areas on purpose. So we'll just gravitate toward our side and stay there in spite of the arguments that are made against the gray areas of our own sides. And I think that's why when you watch all the talking heads on both sides, whether it was Fox or CNN, they kept saying she was really smart and really credible. They constantly continue to use that word credible about her. Even on Fox News, they use that word credible, 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 because Fox News is just as involved in setting up this narrative, setting up this Hegelian dialectic, setting up this divide and conquer routine. So in order for there to be divide and conquer, they have to call her credible. To me, again, I she was incredible to me. I don't know if, if any of you saw her the same way. You can uh, make some comments below. I'd love to hear what you have to say. So let's go ahead and switch to Kavanaugh. Now, Kavanaugh is a funny thing for me because he went to an all-boys uh, Catholic school in the D.C. area. I, too, went to an all-boys military Catholic school, and it was not in the D.C. area, but I did, I did the same. And, you know, to hear him talk about the beer drinking, I'm not trying to project my own experience onto his, but there was plenty of that going on uh, at my all-boys Catholic school, and there was lots of parties, and there were lots of gatherings with girls from the all-girls school across town, the, the Catholic all-girls school. So... All of that discussion kind of rang a bell with me. Now, as a caveat, I want to say I've renounced Catholicism. I denounce it. I believe it's Satanism. I believe if you're praying to Mary and the dead saints that you're practicing witchcraft because that's necromancy, praying to the dead. There's only one mediator between God and mankind, and that's the man Christ Jesus. And there's only one way to pray. That's to the Father in the name of Jesus Christ. That's the only way to pray. So I think if you're praying to anyone else, including the so-called saints and Mary, then you are actually practicing uh, witchcraft and you're, you're conducting a seance, actually. You're praying to the dead and that's uh, forbidden by the scriptures. So that's just one thing. If you're calling a priest father, Jesus said to call no man father in a religious sense. You're, you're sinning there. There are so many ways. If you're bowing before statues, you're breaking the second commandment. So I, I was raised Catholic, went to Catholic schools just as he did, but I have renounced it. I reject it. It is demonic to the core, just being clear about that. So as we continue with him, the thing that was really sketchy about him was this defense Uh, that he made of himself that he never blacked out or he never drank to a point where he was really toasted and had no memory of what occurred. And so the reason why they're hitting this thing is because they're trying to say, well, he could have been drunk to the point of blackout when he did what he supposedly did to Blasey Ford. However, they also were trying to make him look like a liar and uh, and trying to bring up evidence from his time in high school and at Yale where he could have blacked out and that this idea that he kept his cool every time he drank is not plausible. And I tend to agree with that. I just, you know, when he talks about Ralphing in his yearbook, Ralphing meaning throwing up, to me that indicates he, he drank to throwing up. He said he had a sensitive stomach. I mean, please, please. I just, I'm just not buying all that. I think he... I think that's where there's plenty of gray area with him. You know, of course, he had all those calendars, and why would he write on his calendar that he just tried to, you know, sexually assault somebody? It's just, uh, I mean, there's, there's plenty of gray area. Could he have been there? It's possible. I actually don't believe it ever happened, to be perfectly honest with you. And that's really what they want 
Republicans and conservatives to think they 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 want us fighting on the side of there were four people that were supposedly there and none of them can report that they even remember being at such a such a location. And so she has no corroborating evidence. And so then you've got all the Democratic senators telling her, I believe you. I believe you. I know this happened. And there's another gray area thing where Diane Feinstein had information on this long before it was ever presented that they held on to the information so that they could just last second uh, bomb the proceedings and prevent Kavanaugh from being nominated so they could wait till hopefully in the midterm elections where they might have a majority in the Senate and then they could help determine who the next candidate is and they could keep Roe versus Wade alive. Like that's what Lindsey Graham was arguing was their whole point, and that does seem to be what they're doing. What I'm trying to tell you is that the Republicans and the Democrats at that level, they, this is just, uh, this is like bread and circus. This is just giving us some almost entertainment. This is distracting us because they have no plans to do anything about abortion. And- I'll tell you how thick I think they could all be in this. I think it's possible that Brett Kavanaugh could have been briefed and that this was going to happen to him and that his presentation of being a member of the Supreme Court or him being presented by Donald Trump as a candidate for the Supreme Court could have all been a plan that he and his family know that he he was going to be bombed through this uh, on purpose and, you know, he's being well taken care of for it. It could be that much of a conspiracy whereby he... He put on just as big a show as Blasey Ford did. So all these people thick as thieves together, knowing they want to continue in the um, abortion sacrifices they do every year in the, in the numbers of millions, as we've discussed, over a million every year. He's all big part of it, and they want to keep doing it. And, and he's been briefed about all this. He knew what was going to happen. That's what could be going on at this level. Do I know for sure? Do I have evidence? No, but I think of it that way. I think of this as being so much bread and circus, so much um, entertainment for the masses, so much of manipulating us through a psychological operation that I truly believe that at this level, that all of the participants, it's possible they all know what's going on, including Kavanaugh. And if the Republicans had planned to do anything about abortion, they could have made big uh, inroads in this area when Bush was president, George Bush, George W. Bush, the son, was president and he had a majority in the House and Senate. Nothing changed. Nothing at all changed with regard to uh, the laws with regard to abortion in our country. So I think that, for example, Lindsey Graham of South Carolina, he went off on the Democrats. And for if you're a Republican watching, you're thinking, wow, you know, he's been a neocon most of the time. He was against Trump the whole time. And now he's finally standing up for what's right. And you want to celebrate him. But I think he did that. And then they all afterwards went to some back room and they're all smoking cigars and drinking whiskey together and and laughing about the show they just put on the charade they just put on. I think they're all together thick as thieves. I think they're all Freemasons. I think they're all part of the new world order. I think at that level of being a state, uh, a senator, that you, they, that nobody's up there like Mr. Smith goes to Washington. If you ever saw that movie with Jimmy Stewart, there's nobody in power that is at that level that has not been placed there by the system, and they know what they're doing. So. It's funny how when you're watching it, it's hard not to buy that it's all real. It's hard for me. Like like looking at Blasey Ford, the whole time I was thinking all those thoughts about her. And I know they had her do that on purpose so that people on our side would look at her that way. And not to mention how dumb Kavanaugh sounded when he would answer his questions, particularly the ones about whether or not he would ask for an FBI investigation himself. And he just stood there, you know, shifting the subject where he, whereby I thought he could have just replied, you guys are just trying to delay so that we can't get this nomination through before the midterm elections. And he never would say that. And he kept diverting. And, you know, even his control of the language for someone that went to Yale undergrad, Yale law school, he just didn't sound very intelligent or well-spoken. And 
please believe me, I'm not saying I do either, but I'm just saying that these people whose jobs it's been in Blasey Ford and Kavanaugh to use language to, you know, write briefs and summations and, you know, as far as uh, Kavanaugh goes, I mean, this guy should be a professional writer at his level, a professional speaker, a professional orator, a trained attorney. And he just looked baffled and stupid so many times. It was almost embarrassing. So, you know, in that light, they trot out Blasey Ford, who sounded like a, a nine-year-old girl. And then Kavanaugh, who sounded like a, like a jock, you know, like an uneducated jock who, you know, was supposed to be at the top of his class at a, at a, a prestigious prep, you know, Catholic prep school, and obviously going to one of the most number one law school in the country. He said, you know, he just didn't sound like he was in command of his thought process or in command of what he was going to say. Maybe he was trying to stick to the script, and because he couldn't freewheel, he had to, you know, limit his language. But both of them sounded less than what you would expect from people that come from the elite world of education and they're both older it's not like they're in the, this millennial uh, age bracket where education now is so liberalized that uh, people aren't really learning like they did back in their day in my view you know at least back then there was some learning how to learn and not just being force-fed uh, narrative that the liberal elites in education are force-feeding them now I mean, at least back then you know, people in school had to think a little more. And these two, it's just unbelievable to me how they both came off, not just Blasey Ford, but Kavanaugh as well. I think it was just all a huge play, a huge play. And if, and I just, I just don't buy any of it. And the other thing about Kavanaugh before we leave talking about him is that Kavanaugh went to this all-boys Catholic school, Jesuit run. You know that the Pope is a Jesuit, and if you study the Jesuits, you know that they have done all sorts of lying through history and killing and murders and this and that. Uh, it's quite an evil group if you if you look into it. And this man is a Jesuit, or he was least at least taught by them. And so you've got that angle, and I'm just not buying it. I'm just not buying it. And they may they may succeed at stopping his nomination and getting someone more liberal. But the whole point of that is that they are not going to ever stop doing abortion in our country. It's only going to get worse. There's only going to be more uh, satanic offerings because we are entering the end times. And Satan knows his time is short and he has come but for to rob, kill, and destroy. And I just don't believe that our nation is redeemable anymore. 60 million babies later, I don't believe that this nation is truly going to repent. I don't go on that plane, you know, last year, you know, or earlier this year, flying over our country and seeing all those uh, churches, so-called, with steeples on top, and all of these erect phalluses to the heavens, just outright heresy and a slap in the face to our God, the true God of the Bible. I just don't see our nation being able to U-turn that hard. Hey, if it can happen, please let it happen. I don't want to see any babies uh, murdered this way. It's horrible. It's horrible that the most, the only innocent blood among us is the is the most deaths per year in our nation is, among, is the most innocent blood. That's who's killed the most in our country over a million a year since 1973. It's dark. It's dark. On average, I know there's been a couple years we might have been right under a million, but for the most part, it's been over a million a year. We've been up to as high as 1.5 million abortions a year in certain years. I did a whole podcast on it that you can watch. I'll put the link below. It's absolute darkness. And we are being played like a fiddle, and I'm not buying it. Maybe you think I'm crazy to think that there's a conspiracy at that level, but I just know that Jesus called Satan the prince of this world three times in the book of John, and he is the prince of this world, and his time is short, and he's using his pawns, his political leaders, to just create divide-and-conquer strategies, and the ultimate goal is to continue these murders, 
to bring us into a situation where we drop our borders and become one world, have a one world government, we're going to have a one world religion, and we're going to have a one world currency. And at some point, you will not be able to buy or sell without the mark of the beast as referred to in Revelation 13. That he would cause all, great and small, rich and poor, to take the mark of the beast. And without that mark, you will not be able to buy or sell. Is it the chip that everybody, all these companies are giving to their people already, like that one in Wisconsin? I think it is. But whatever it is, it's going to be either on your right hand or in your forehead, it says. And it's ironic that those chips, they only, those RFID chips, they only work at the temperature that's in your, in your forehead or in your, or in your forehand. It's the only two places it'll actually work. Don't take that chip. If your company offers you one, don't take one. I would leave that any company that would cause you to take a chip or, or offer you a chip, I would leave uh, forthwith. It's time for us Christians to figure out how to live outside outside of this world system. It's time to put your trust in the Lord and to make preparations spiritually. I'm not even talking about physically. A lot of preppers have bought property and they've grown gardens and they have wells and they have solar and they're completely off the grid and that's all well and good. But you're going to be on the run at some point if the Bible's right. After the first three and a half years of the tribulation, which we haven't entered just yet, we're all going to be on the run. So all those things that, that we're saving up or trying to hoard so that we'll be ready for that, we're not going to have access to, especially in America. I mean, there's not one plot of land that hasn't been designated as a piece of property that belongs to the state or to the county where you live. It's all been set, set apart in the sense that it's taxed. And your taxable land, how are you going to pay your taxes when you don't, when you ha can't take the mark? You're going to literally be like Israel was when they fled from Egypt in the wilderness. We're going to be like it was with the Jews during the Second World War, where you've got, you know, Anne Frank and family hiding up in, in a attic somewhere in Holland. It's going to be a lot of us are going to have to flee. It says the Antichrist is going to make war against the saints. It says he'll make war against the saints and he will overcome them. But Jesus said to fear not what they can do to our bodies. Because this body can die only once. And then you, get, you inherit eternal life after that. And eternal bliss. And you have to put up with this system anymore. So love not your life unto death. But this is all a setup for what's happening what the scriptures predicted would happen in the book of daniel and matthew 24 and revelation and ezekiel 37 and 38 all of these things and 39 all of these things are, are beginning to come to pass and we are in the time right now and what this this week tells me about america is that we're done in my spirit watching it i was like we're finished this country's finished it's over. It's over for us. We've been taken over by the wicked. They've been in power since the beginning, but this just takes it to a whole other level. It says in Psalms 112, the wicked walk on every side when the vilest men are exalted. And that's what we have. These men that are in power, the ones that were in that, that Senate hall, they're fighting for abortion. It all comes down to Roe v. Wade. They've admitted as much. That's the wicked. And the wicked in this nation has been multiplied. And we as a nation are no longer worthy of God's protection. When you farm out as much pornography as we do, when you teach the rest of the world how to sin sexually, and you act like Babylon, there's no more protection for us. But there is protection for God's people. We that are God's people are as, we're as wheat among the chaff. Among the tares. We're just growing up among the tares. And we're no better than any other nation. We are not better than any other nation. We are a Freemasonic nation. We are being run by Freemasons. The wicked are exalted on every side. And we just need to face the facts about that. And just take responsibility for ourselves. Our, our power to influence government... They put on a show for us to make us think we have the power to influence them. And then they set up these Hegelian dialectics 
And then you know that you don't. I don't even believe that any votes are truly counted correctly. I think that's all pomp and circumstance for us. They just put on a show for us. They make it seem like our votes count when they don't really. They put on voter registration pushes and drives and all that, but it's all just a show. They're going to put in power who they want in power. It's a show. We are a joke of a nation. It's a joke what we've become, what the U.S. has become. And they have tricked us through so many false flags to go off and fight wars and have sacrificed our men through many, many wars. They sacrificed our men to to battle over and over and over again. You know, there's stuff you can find online about World War II being a false flag, or at least what happened with the Japanese attacking Pearl Harbor in Hawaii and sinking the Arizona. There's evidence that FDR held off our held off our defenses so that would happen, so that we would enter the war. So right there, I think roughly 3,000 men may have died in that. All those men died from something that was completely preventable. Same thing with what happened in 9-11, please, Building 7. If you think the, the first two buildings would have fallen like that, just straight down with just almost at free fall levels, because planes hit them in the upper portions of those buildings. If you think the whole thing would have just pancaked down a perfect symmetry like that, and that there was no uh, ordnance set up inside those buildings to explode them like it would normally when you, when you take down a building, I think that's insane. Now, maybe I'm wrong about that. I'm not an engineer. I barely passed math and science. But I'll tell you this much. Building 7 doesn't fall on its own. Why did Building 7 fall? Please. Please, <laughs> nothing hit Building 7. Fires wouldn't have brought it down. There have been plenty of skyscraper buildings that have burned completely and not fallen or had several floors of it burn and, and nothing, and, and the, the structure remained. So I'm just not buying that Building 7 would have fallen. And then there's video of, I think it was the BBC, saying Building 7 had fallen, and yet behind her, it was still in her picture. And then it fell like 30 seconds to a minute later so she had information that had fallen before it fell i don't care if you think i'm crazy about that i don't care i just do my research and i look into things and i don't trust the governments of this world i think that they put on shows for us they put on uh, real-time movies for us and they get us they manipulate us psychologically and make us into sheeple with their with their stage plays that they run. It's that simple. It really is that simple. So dark. And so that's why I'm telling you, you got to stop trusting in man. Stop trusting in man and trust in the Lord and his word. Let God be true and every man a liar. Let his word be true. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. He's also the word of God. Thy word is truth. God doesn't lie. He's not going to lie to you. He's not going to gaslight you. He's going to tell you the truth. And so stop putting your trust in political parties because obviously the Democrats are just outright brazen uh, murderers. And they obviously want socialism and communism and they they want one world government and and no borders. And they push that all that stuff outright in your face. And the Republicans act like they want something more conservative. But believe me, the the conservatives, so-called conservatives in power, including Trump, it's all a game. It's all rigged. They're they're just trying to pander to Christians and conservatives. And I'm going to end it on this note. Why would they even pander to us? Why would they pander to us? I think that Alex Jones is a psyop. Why would he pander to us? Why do they put someone in there? Well, there's a couple reasons. They want to control the opposition. They want to funnel us in to whatever direction they want to lead us. And then we'll receive what they tell us and we'll go in that direction. That's one reason. The other reason is we'll be easily identifiable. What I mean is they'll use Facebook, for example, or any other kind of social media where you're actually placing comments or, you know, writing comments or putting uh, notes or, or, or stories or citing stories that are conservative on there. And then they have a dossier on you and they know exactly who you are. 
And it's very clear in Revelation, as I cited earlier, that one of the things the Antichrist is going to do is make war against the saints. Well, dossiers have been built on many of us through social media that tell them exactly who we are, where we live, who our friends are, who our families are. And if Hitler had had these these things, he would have been thrilled. They have way more on us than anyone in history has ever had. Databases are built on each and every person through your IP address, through your Facebook accounts, through your Google accounts, through your Gmail. They have every email you've ever sent. They have everything in a dossier that they can look at about you. And people like me that have um, podcasts and, and YouTube channels and stuff, I mean, we're obviously out in the open. I frankly don't care. I know God is my protector. And, you know, he's all of our protectors, whether or not we're, we're public in what we say or do anyway. And God's going to protect us just like he hid Israel in the desert and he protected them. But I just say all that to say is what's the point of all this? The point is they want to identify us now so that later on when they can, when they can and will attack us, they will. That's why I caution people against buying stuff from an Alex Jones type place like his, his health remedies and so on. I caution you about that because I do think he's a psyop. And if you buy stuff from him at some point, why wouldn't they just drop poison in there and kill every one of us that have bought his stuff? You know what I'm saying? If he truly is a psyop. I know that sounds crazy and conspiratorial on my part, but I just, I think that that's stuff that they will do. I just do. And I know I'm not crazy. I know I want to be careful about what I take into my system. And that's why I sure am glad that Jesus said in Mark 16 that if uh, these signs shall follow them that believe, if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not harm them. And I just praise God for that, that he will protect us from being poisoned in those things. But I'm just saying that they have a purpose through all of these psyops, through the Republican, Democrat, Hegelian dialectic. They have purposes with all of this to funnel us into tribalism and divide and conquer so they can continue their, their, their work behind the scenes and get our eyes off of what they're doing. You know, if you look at those Georgia Guidestones, I've never been there, but I've seen many pictures of what it says on there. It says to keep the population at 500 million. And here we are at, what are we, close to 7 or 8 billion? So they want to knock about 80% of us off. <laughs> I mean, they, they want to have, these elite want to have their own utopia with all of us uh, serfs gone. They don't want us here. And that's one reason why they're running this whole Agenda 21 thing and they're quarantining off, uh, you know, much of the land in, in North America, as, you know, especially in the U.S. as national parks, the most beautiful parts of our, of our scenery and of our topography. They have quarantined off and they allow us to go in there for, you know, $25 a day and take a look at it. But nobody can live there because they have a plan. They have a plan. But see, what they don't realize, somehow they've been tricked into thinking that Revelation's not going to work itself out. They really do think that Lucifer is going to win for them. They think that Lucifer actually cares about them and wants what's best for them. They think that when Lucifer tricked Eve into taking of the fruit, that she actually was enlightened then. And that was a good thing, that she was freed from the Matrix at that point. So... They have it all on its head. Everything up is down, black is white. They believe a lie. And they don't believe that Jesus Christ is going to come back and land on the Mount of Olives and destroy them. They don't believe that he's going to have a millennial reign and that he can actually conquer Lucifer. They've been tricked by him. And so what we've got to hold on to is that we are serving the God who created all of this. And he is going to give us an eternity with him he's promised in the book of revelation and yeah we may suffer some things now but we don't but we don't need to be afraid we need to trust in him and overcome with him and know that he's got our back no matter what happens and that this life is but a vapor anyway and what he has for us in eternity this will all be long forgotten so we just have to stay the course and stay in that love affair with god the father through his son jesus christ and not let these narratives that they put up sidetrack us and divert us from what we need to do with regard to serving him because that's what what it's all about is getting us fighting battles that aren't aren't really the battles of the lord you know 
it says in Ephesians that we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but with principalities and powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world. What we need to do now and be doing is fighting the enemy and doing the spiritual warfare to get those of us in the, in the true body of Christ without spot or wrinkle and holy and without blemish as a bride waiting for a bridegroom, that we are going to be clean and pure for his second coming, which happens after the tribulation, by the way. There's no pre-trib rapture. Those of you that believe that, you've been fooled and tricked. No one even believed that until the 1800s. No one, no one in the history of biblical scholarship ever believed that until recently, you know, in the last 200 years. So it's a bunch of hogwash. Nobody's going anywhere. We're all going to see it. We're all going to be here. And those that are resurrected when Jesus comes back are the ones that died during the tribulation and that were beheaded for his name. The Bible, that makes it clear. So there's no giant um, resurrection of all Christians when he comes back. That's not the case. It's only those that were beheaded. And then he comes back and he rules and reigns for the thousand year reign. And at the end of that, the devil's let out for a little season. There's one more, one more battle between him and Jesus and then Everyone that's against Jesus gets cast into the to the um, the lake of fire that burns with brimstone forever and ever, and then there becomes a new heaven and a new earth, and this whole old system's done away with, and there's going to be no more pain, sorrow, or crying, or death, or any such thing. All that's going to be done away with. And we're going to have an eternity in just the most amazing uh, situation you could ever imagine. We can't even imagine it. It's so much better than we could ask or think. So. That's what we're holding on to. And all of this right now, it's just all the world's a stage, as, as their writer Shakespeare said, and they're just putting on a play for us. And we, we have to not get caught up in their narrative so much that we forget the truth of Jesus Christ and what he's leading us into. Yes, fighting against abortion, I think that's important. But I think we need to understand that the fight that we put on and all the energy that we give to that it's not, it hasn't stopped an abortion since 73. Now, those of us that have intervened with people that are about to have an abortion and have prayed with them, yes, let's keep doing that. But as far as being a part of the political process, I believe with my whole heart, and some of you may say that I'm completely wrong about this, but I believe my whole heart, that's a waste of time now and that we need to just be working on spreading the gospel, getting people saved, helping people to live in a biblical way and showing them how to understand God's word and to obey it. And that is should be the main thrust of what we're doing in these last days because being part of these political operations, to me, that's just a diversionary tactic to keep you from helping people get saved and delivered and set free. And uh, that's what all this comes down to. Uh, it's all a dog and pony show. It's, it's, it's magic acts. It's smoke and mirrors. That's what all of this is. I thought this was going to be a 10 or 15 minute uh, podcast, and here we are at 55 minutes, and I am so sorry for that. I just want to conclude with prayer. Father God, I just praise you and thank you for showing us what's going on and how we really need to focus on you and on your word and on your orders to us was to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And I am just asking you to help us to stay focused on what you want us to do, to clean up our own lives, to get us our lives in line with your word, to help those of us that are newer to the gospel understand what that means and to walk in the power of your word and the authority of your name. Help us to be your servants, Lord, and not servants of this earthly kingdom. We want to be servants of your kingdom. Help us to know what that means for each one of us to lead and guide us, go before us to make the crooked path straight, and help us to walk this life out the way that you would have us do so. I pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. And Father, I just thank you for blessing each and every one that listened to hear this message and to be able to discern the, what the meaning is for them and what it means for their lives and help them to walk in it. I pray all these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. I want to thank you for listening. Again, if you'd like to download the music you're hearing, you can go to ReverbNation.com forward slash without spot or bonus ministry music. There's a link below for that. There's also a link below for our blog spot, which is without spot or blemish blogspot.com. Our handle on YouTube is without spot or blemish ministry. And also, if you would like to make a donation, there's a link for that below. Or you could go to PayPal directly, paypal.com. And our handle there is without spot at gmail.com, which is also our email address. You can contact us there with a prayer request and praise reports. We'd love to hear from you. And thanks for listening, and we'll see you 
at the next podcast. On his return when you are done. Whoa, when you are done. Days can darker, life seems so short when you are done. Days can darker, life ain't too long when you are done. What's in your heart? What's in your mind? The spirit of truth? Or the lying kind before you're done Better get it right before you're done Days can darker, life seems so short when you are done Days can darker, life ain't so long when you are done Time to get it right You only get one life Better make sure God is your life Before you're done and Tonight you end up under the side and you are done. Whoa, and you are done. Days getting darker, life seems so short when you are done. Days getting darker, life ain't too long when you are done. done.